So, it is now my pleasure to introduce Lewis Bollard. Lewis is originally from Wellington, New Zealand, and he now leads the Open, Philanthropies, Open Philanthropy Project's work on farm animal welfare. Prior to joining Open Philanthropy, he worked in animal protection litigation and as a policy advisor and international liaison for the CEO at the Humane Society of the United States. Lewis graduated from Harvard with a BA in social studies and has a JD from Yale Law School. At Yale, he was president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund and author of an award-winning paper called Ag Gag on the unconstitutionality of laws restricting undercover investigations on farms. He's here to talk about recent policy progress on animal welfare in the corporate, local, and national government levels. Please join me in welcoming Lewis Bollard. Cool. Well, uh, thank you all for coming out today. Um, I'm excited to be in a room with so many people who uh, care about doing, doing good in the world, and I suspect for many of you care particularly about animals. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the corporate and political advocacy that's been done within the farm animal uh, world and the, uh, the lessons that we can take from that, from that work uh, for other EA causes. So as a little background, um, the Open Flying 3 project, uh, farm animal welfare is a relatively new cause area. We've been in this for about a year and a half. In that time, we've made almost $30 million in uh, funding commitments. So a lot of these are over two or three years. Um, and if you look at that kind of breakdown, um, one thing you'll immediately notice is that there's a lot of corporate campaigns. So there's the cage free corporate campaigns, there's broiler welfare corporate campaigns. Some of the general operating support and fish welfare are also corporate campaigns. Uh, and there's almost no political advocacy in there. And so part of my uh, job today is to explain why that is. So I want to cover three things today. Uh, the first is the success of corporate uh, farm animal campaigns and, and why we think uh, they've succeeded. Secondly, the failure of political farm animal campaigns and some, some possible explanations for that. And thirdly, what lessons we can take for EA policy advocacy in general. So beginning with the success of the corporate cage-free campaign. So what you're seeing is a typical battery cage. This was actually a photo I took myself on a, a factory farm in India about a month ago. Um, but these look very similar anywhere in the world. Um, and until two years ago, uh, about 290 million of the 300 million laying hens in the United States were raised in these cages. And it's still the case that about 6 billion of the 7 billion laying hens globally are raised in these cages. So it's a very standard form of production. But something started happening in really early 2015. There'd been, there had been sort of some work before this, but really it, it only became an organized uh, movement in, in early 2015, where a number of groups started to focus their attention on battery cages and specifically on corporate campaigns to get rid of battery cages. And so they began these uh, campaigns against the company where it was just a very clear ask of all of the companies, which was you need to publicly commit to phasing out the use of battery cages within your supply chain within the next 10 years or less. And this campaign really took off in late 2015. So what you're seeing here, this graph, is an indication of how many hens will be affected by these pledges once implemented uh, in terms of the time at which those pledges were secured by advocacy groups. And what happened in at the start of 2015 was the groups secured pledges from major food service providers like Aramark and Compass Group and Sodexo. In late 2015, they got the major uh, fast food companies. So in September, they got McDonald's. After that, they got Burger King and, and a number of the other major players. And then in early 2016, that major spike you can see in the graph is when they got the grocers. That's when Walmart came on board, Kroger came on board, and other major players. And so to explain what we're talking about, this is, is the transition that we're looking at. So what you see on one side is a photo, uh, again, that I took in a battery cage facility. And what you're seeing on the other side is a photo of a Natura Avery system, which is the most common form of Avery system, the most common cage-free system that is being adopted by US producers. And as you can see from that photo, the, it's still a factory farm. It's still crowded. The, the hens certainly do not have access to the outdoors and will not have access to the outdoors. 
Um, but there are some, some things that I think are pretty significant improvements there. Most noticeably, they have more space. They have the ability to rise up and, and perch, which we think hens have a pretty strong preference to do. They have access to nesting boxes and to litter to dust bathe. Um, and we actually have a, an ongoing internal investigation at the Open Philanthropy Project into the relative costs and benefits of, of cage versus cage-free production, which will hopefully be online in the next few weeks. So that, that will also kind of provide some additional information on this. Um, but so one of the, the, the kind of critical questions about these corporate campaigns is, are they just fluff? Are they just words? Are they, are they meaningless, essentially? And, and partly, that's still something to be tested. That's something we, we still don't know if Walmart's going to make good on its pledge. But what you're seeing here on this graph is, first, the blue line is when these pledges kick in. So how many hens will be affected as these pledges kick in over time? And as you can see, most of them kick in in 2023, 2024, 2025. Um, but what you're seeing on the red line, which I think is encouraging, is where the egg industry is at in terms of how many hens are now in cage-free production. So we're already at a point where there are four times as many US hens in cage-free production as there were two years ago. Um, and the way that that line is currently projected to go wouldn't get us to where we want to go if, if the egg industry caters off. But this is really, from our perspective, less an argument that these campaigns aren't working and more an argument that there will need to be an enduring effort to hold companies to their pledges, to implement milestones, to make sure that they follow through. Another major question that we had about the cage-free campaigns, in addition to whether they will result in, in actual changes, is whether this was a replicable strategy. And there's certainly a valid argument that by the time that we got involved in supporting the cage-free campaigns, which was late 2015, there'd already been a huge amount of advocacy, and, and there'd already been a huge amount to build up the political environment. There'd been undercover investigations for years. There'd been people talking about battery cages for years. And so it's totally possible that at that point it was kind of inevitable that US companies at some point were going to go cage-free. But that kind of advocacy had not been taking place all over the world. There'd been some of it in Europe. There'd been a small amount in Canada, but there really hadn't been anything like this in Latin America. And so we made a set of grants in the middle of 2016 to the same groups that had been spearheading the work in the US, Mercy for Animals, the Humane League, and others, and made grants to them to extend that work into Europe and into Latin America. And what you're seeing here is a very rough tally as of today of how many corporate victories they've secured on Cage Free in each of these countries. And so what you see is, first of all, in Canada, they've had phenomenal success, which isn't really surprising given it's the same companies, the same environment. Um, but I think what's really heartening to me here is not just the UK, but also seeing Brazil and parts of Latin America where there really hadn't been these, this kind of advocacy previously, these campaigns coming in and working as, as a model that can get change in those countries too. And I think the even bigger test of whether this is replicable will be whether it's replicable for broiler chickens. So a as we speak, advocates in the US have now really turned their attention from cage-free campaigns to the welfare of broiler chickens who are raised for meat. There are about 300 million, cage uh, sorry, 300 million laying hens at any point in time in the United States. There are about 1.5 billion broiler chickens at any point in time. It's the largest uh, anim farm animal industry in the United States. And so far, things have been encouraging. Advocates have been pushing companies to either adopt global animal partnership certification or to adopt a set of four reforms focused around improving genetics, living conditions, um, slaughter, and getting rid of overcrowding. And so far, they've clocked up about 35 wins, including the major food service companies again, and now starting to include some of the major fast food companies like Burger King and Subway. So this raises the question of, of why these campaigns were successful. And if you're interested in reading more on this topic, we just put up a blog about it at openphilanthropy.org, where we go through what we think are kind of all the explanations of this. But I want to focus on three things that I think were critical. The first was the focus on a clear goal. So for years, for decades really, animal advocates had focused on a huge variety of issues. And understandably so, given there is suffering baked into the factory farming system across animal testing in all areas. And even as of two, three years ago, there were corporate campaigns on dairy welfare, corporate campaigns on beef cattle welfare, on chicken welfare, on pig welfare, and so on. And so something that I think was critical was the groups came together about two years ago and said, we're all going to focus on battery cages. We're all going to make our goal to get rid of battery cages in the United States. And that will be the only goal 
for the present time. And that not only created a momentum and created more resources focused on a topic, it also created an easier ask of companies who weren't being confronted with a myriad of issues, but rather one very clear cut issue. The second thing that I think was, was critical was the willingness to use hard hitting campaign tactics. And what, what you're seeing here is a website put up by Mercy for Animals. It's wendys.chickentorture.com. Uh, I also recommend walmarttorturesanimals.com. Uh, and as you see, they're willing to confront companies with hard hitting advertising. And you know, there's a video here linking the company to animal cruelty. And I think what's important about this is that the animal rights movement has always had radical advocacy. But often that radical advocacy has focused on radical asks. And we've, and we've had some success with that, to be clear. But what I think is kind of unique is radical advocacy focused on very moderate asks. So asking for something relatively small in the scheme of things, but being willing to go with radical tactics to seek that goal. And then the third thing which I think has been really critical has been a willingness to test and use multiple levers of change. And there's really been a kind of trial and error process, tri trial and error process here where groups have just tested and said, does this tactic work with this company? And if it doesn't, they move on to a different tactic. And I think a good example is the uh, 2015 campaign against Costco, which was the first major grocer to commit to go cage free. It was about a six month long campaign. It opened with uh, a major undercover investigation done at one of Costco's, uh, Costco's largest egg supplier. It then uh, produced an op-ed in the New York Times written by Bill Mayer, and that was, that was uh, in the New York Times the same day as the investigation launched. Advocates then started a change.org petition that got over 100,000 signatures. They then got a US senator to write a letter to the company. And then they got Brad Pitt involved. Uh, that, that was the game changer. Um, <laughs> But uh, there, there were obviously a variety of other tactics used in this campaign, but I think what this sort of shows is a willingness, first of all, to persevere in the campaign and to just continue until they win, but also to just keep seeing what works, seeing what gets attention, seeing what really gets to the company. So turning now to the political farm animal campaigns, and really what I want to explain here is, is why we haven't seen similar political process, uh, progress in the US to what we've seen on the corporate front. And I think the first and strongest explanation is the political and regulatory capture by agribusiness lobbyists. And so this is kind of an example in point. In 2015, the New York Times ran this major front page expose about the abuse of animals at a place in Nebraska called the US Meat Animal Research Center. And there are two things that really stand out to me about this example. The first is that this center was run by the US Department of Agriculture. The US Department of Agriculture is the only federal agency charged with any regulation of animal welfare in the United States. And yet it was the one in this case running cruel experiments with the sole aim of increasing agricultural productivity and profitability, which is the agency's dual aim and clearly a superior aim in its mind to promoting animal welfare. But the second piece was the political capture. So here you had a very clear set of facts. You had national outrage about it, a huge amount of coverage of the issue. You even had congressional hearings. And no agricultural group wanted to come on record defending this. And so there was a bill put forward that was a very moderate, very small fix. It, it literally got rid of a loophole in the Animal Welfare Act. And no agricultural group came out against it publicly. And initially, a number of senators and representatives signed on as co-sponsors. Then the agricultural groups went around privately and met with all the representatives and senators and said, hey, we don't like the president of anything happening on animal welfare at the federal level. The bill ultimately only got 10 co-sponsors in the Senate and died. And when you have a clear cut issue like this, such a small moderate ask, and it can still only get so far, to me it's a powerful indicator of, of the challenges we face on the political front. The second set of challenges on the political front relate to political structure. So, there are two parts of this that I want to highlight. First, what you're seeing um, are, is, is a map of the United States highlighting states by whether they've passed positive farm animal welfare protection laws uh, of, of various kinds, banning veal crates, gestation crates, or battery cages, um, and whether they've passed negative laws, uh, specifically ag gag laws, seeking to criminalize undercover investigations on factory farms. And what's really noticeable about this are uh, two things. First, the states where all the farm animals live Iowa, North Carolina, Georgia, 
have not only not passed positive laws, but in those states, agribusiness has enough power in the legislature to pass negative laws to prevent even undercover investigations. The second thing which is kind of remarkable to me is even these states that are in green or in blue that have passed some kind of positive law, it was almost always because of a ballot measure or the threat of a ballot measure. So in both California in 2008 and in Massachusetts in 2016, there had previously been bills in the legislature seeking to ban veal crates, gestation crates, battery cages. Not common practices in the states with the exception of battery cages in California. And even in these incredibly liberal states with small agricultural industries, these bills died in the agricultural committees. And this is the other structural issue, is that all farm animal welfare bills start in the ag committee. And the people who choose to sit in the ag committee are people who represent rural areas. And so these bills died. And sure enough, when they got placed on the, the ballot, in California, 67% of Californians voted for it. In Massachusetts, 78% voted for it. And yet, even with that kind of support, these bills originally still couldn't make it through the state legislature. And then the third, the third issue I want to highlight, which I think goes beyond the United States and is a global issue, is the salience of this. And so what you're seeing in this map is, is a really rough indication of states globally in terms of whether they have any legal protection for farm animals uh, and, and whether that's enforced at all. And, and what I really want to highlight is just that it's a, it's a tiny fraction of the world's countries that have meaningful farm animal welfare protections, a few northern European countries. Um, in much of the rest of the world, you either have no protections or very weak and unenforced protections. And I think what's, what's interesting here is that when polls have been done, certainly in Europe and in the United States, and to a lesser degree there have been polls done in Latin America, you find consistently across countries, 70, 80 plus percent of people, saying they support increased protections for farm animals. So on the one hand, you would think that, you know, particularly in countries with less of a lobbying influence, maybe this would be reflected on the laws. But what you also see is when the polls ask, and they normally don't, but when they ask about salience, when they say, rank these issues, rank this alongside of healthcare, jobs, education, animal welfare ends up like number 20. And in that environment, it's totally rational for politicians to say, I know that 70% of people say they want this, but for all of them, it's voting issue number 20. And then I've got 10% of people over here who it's voting issue number one, they want me to go in the other direction. And in that case, it's a real problem that for us, for, for most people, this is a less salient issue than it is for factory farmers and other people who have their jobs uh, tied up in the system. The final explanation I want to give on the political point is the lack of bipartisan support. So what you see here is a list of co-sponsors of the last serious piece of farm animal welfare legislation introduced in the Federal Congress. This was in 2010. Uh, and what you can see is of the 40 co-sponsors, there were only two Republicans. Both of them are no longer representatives. Uh, and it's, it's just been a trend over time that more and more so, only Democrats will vote for this issue. And the problem that creates is that even if you get all the Democrats, you're relying on having the House, the Senate, and the presidency in Democratic hands. And in reality, you don't even get all the Democrats, because there are some Democrats who represent factory farming districts. And so you end up with this impossible math to get to the number you would ever need to pass federal legislation. So what can we learn about this for EA policy advocacy? How can we avoid the, uh, the slip-ups that have been made? So I think one common uh, lesson here is to focus on clear, narrow goals. And I don't know if this is necessarily a great example of this, but I, I, I like, for instance, with Deworm the World, the Deworm the World initiative of, of uh, Evidence Action, the Give Well Top Charity, they have a very clear sense of the problem and a very narrowly defined it. And when you compare this with like the UNICEF website, and I recognize UNICEF is a far larger group, it's just so much clearer here what they're doing, what their goal is, and how they're going to do it. And to me, that seems analogous to what has helped these corporate campaigns succeed. I think another key insight from my perspective has been to focus on institutions rather than individuals. And so this is uh, an image from the Fed Up campaign, which is uh, a campaign that the Open Philanthropy Project supports on, on monetary policy. And, and this campaign has not made any effort to tell all Americans they should care about monetary policy. What it's done is it's targeted the key decision makers at the Fed who will actually decide monetary policy. And I think in some ways that seems really obvious, 
But I think for a long period of the farm animal movement, what we tried to do was convince consumers one by one to go out and, and buy cage-free eggs or to you know, go vegetarian, which could, could still be an effective intervention. But what you see at the institutional level is you can have the same impact as persuading 100,000 people if you get a major institution. But it's almost never going to be 100,000 times more difficult than persuading that one individual. And the final, uh, the final thought is uh, to find the low-hanging fruit. And, and again, uh, this is the sort of thing that's, that seems obvious until you realize how uncommon it is. Um, but looking in the area of biosecurity, I thought it was an interesting example to look at the Blue Ribbon Study Panel where they explicitly have focused on national security. Now, national security may not be the greatest biosecurity threat, but in this political climate, far more likely to get attention than something about a more speculative health or catastrophic risk. So with that, I'd like to open up to uh, questions. And if you're interested in uh, uh, getting more of, of, of what I have to say, you can either follow me on Twitter or I have an incredibly hard to uh, read newsletter URL. But if you sign up for that, uh, if you can make your way through it, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll get a monthly newsletter with some, some thoughts. Thanks. Let's have a seat. All right, so we've got some questions coming in um, from the audience. The first one, uh, nice and light. <laughs> How do you maintain a positive attitude that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning, given the <laughs> depressing enormity of the work that you do? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is really depressing. I think, um, I mean, I think a lot of people in the farm animal movement kind of go through stages. Uh, and, and maybe it's like the stages of like grief like there's a, you know, there's an initial just like shock and then there's like a deep abiding sadness and, and then hopefully you come out the other end and you feel some kind of sense of resolution about like trying to do something good from it. But I, I don't know if I'm necessarily like, you know, the right person to guide people on their psychology on this. I think, uh, I, I think I, all, all I can say is that it seems to generally be more effective to be positive than to be negative, with the exception of like corporate campaigns where I think like they've been really negative and, and I think effective, but it's controlled negativity. It's not yelling at the world. It's, it's a very specific target. And I think that's, that's what can be effective. Yeah, focus. So a, a question kind of related to that point. Um, how do you think about, so obviously that's an incremental approach, mm -hmm. right? It, it's focused, it's narrow, and as you said, it has a very clear Definitely. kind of relatively mm -hmm. easy to implement yeah. ask. Um, do you think that leads us to a place where we end up with full animal rights, whatever full might mean? Um, the, the questioner sort of draws a potential distinction between this and, say, the civil rights sure. movement or the, the women's rights movements, yeah. where the, the question was not, you know, was not so narrowly defined, but was kind yeah. of framed as, like, this needs to change in a mm -hmm. holistic way. Yeah, so, I mean, my, my personal opinion is that all social movements have been incremental. And maybe not as incremental as we're being, but I mean, if you look at the history of civil rights, it didn't begin in the 1960s. I mean, it, it, it began prior to the abolition of slavery. It progressed through that, through a set of civil rights laws in the 1870s, which then required more enforcement in the 1900s, which then required uh, litigation by Thurgood Marshall and others in the 1940s and 50s. And all of these were incremental wins. At no point did they get justice. I mean, they still, there still isn't, right? There's still serious civil rights problems in the country. So I think. I think, um, in my view, everything's incremental. Now, that, that doesn't mean that um, it's, it's wrong to critique these as being too incremental. I mean, I think it's totally valid to say, maybe you should be looking more at, at bigger transformative things. So, you know, can we get plant-based meat uh, or, or clean or cultured meat that can, uh, can displace all meat? And, and we have done some, some work to support that. So we did a major investment in Impossible Foods, which has, has that, that exact focus to it. Um, my, my kind of orientation is as much as possible to focus on how can we reduce the most suffering. And for the purposes of that, I am less concerned about the end game and more concerned about how do we get rid of the first half of, of you know, farm animal suffering in the world, and then how do we get rid of the next half. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think it's a totally valid critique. So this might be a tough question, but are you able to empathize with the people who are on the other side of this issue, that 10%, you know, who sort of run the farms, mm -hmm. uh, notably who have the most 
contact with the animals, mm -hmm. and yet disagree, obviously, you mm -hmm. know, quite strongly. Yeah. Um, can, is there any, can you give any sort of sympathetic or empathetic uh, sort of version of, of their point of view? Is there any, uh, and if not, does that limit <laughs> your ability to, to reach them? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm not sure we need to reach them. I mean, I guess, like, I, I think, like, I, I generally tend to think that it's, it's not going to be the most effective way to try and persuade people to have, a, you know, an immoral about turn where they give up on factory farming. And it's, it's going to be more effective to have their customers, like McDonald's, who are far less invested in the system than they are, tell them that changes need to happen. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that, that most people in factory farming are evil people. I think that what they're doing makes sense given they have solely optimized for profitability and productivity. And so, you know, like, I mean, some of them are in direct contact with animals. Many of them are not. I mean, many of the people in factory farming industries never see these animals. Um, but, the, uh, but just because they're, they're there seeing them, you know, I think they still, they, they view them as productivity machines. And um, that seems to be pretty kind of pretty consistent. And I think most people just have a different view from that. And I, I'm glad most people do. I mean, I think most people agree that it matters whether these animals have decent lives as well as whether they're productive. Um, and that just really doesn't fit within the calculus of, of the sort of average factory farmer. Yeah, I forget who, who uh, said it, but there's a, the great quote that, uh, you know, no amount of evidence can convince somebody to believe something if their salary depends on them, uh, you know, not <laughs> totally. believing it. Totally. So that definitely seems to be in play here. Uh, a very practical question. There are a lot of people here, and in fact, this this conference is really, to some extent, about changing your plans and, and sort of and making new plans. What uh, advice or guidance would you give to people who want to make an impact uh, on this issue? Where do you think people should go with their time, energy, and creativity? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there are a bunch of great options, and I'm I'm sure uh, eighty thousand hours has has more ideas. Um, but I, I do think there are real needs for talent in the movement. So you know, I mean, if you're earning to give, that's that's great, and and an excellent way to support things. But I, I think there is always a need for talented people in all sorts of roles within advocacy organizations. Whether you're talented at, at IT, whether you're talented at campaigning, you know, talented at any kind of thing, advocacy organizations need that. Um, for people who have a science bent, I think the most exciting stuff right now is on, on the plant-based or you know, clean cultured meat research side. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's, it's going and being a researcher at a university, or uh, going and joining a startup, I, I think that is probably the most effective thing that someone with a science um, background can do. Um, you know, and then I do think that there are, there are kind of other interesting paths, like can you go into politics and, and make a difference that way? I think there are some people trying out some other interesting things I know less about, but you know, could be, could be worth a try. When you think about your sort of vision for the future of animals in our world, um, obviously there are some, you know, many, many, many who are suffering terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, there may also be some, you know, you think of the sort of mythical cows in Japan that get uh, <laughs> lullabies sung to them and massages and stuff, um, who, whose lives, you know, may end not so well, but mm -hmm. could arguably sure. be worth living. Do you have kind of a vision of what a just world looks like with human and, and animal interaction? Or is the, the whole sort of thing just kind of swept away in, in your vision of the future? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think there are several different plausible visions of the future. One is definitely one in which plant-based or cellular-based uh, meats have, have displaced farm animals. But that still creates questions around our treatment of wild animals and, or, or our non-treatment of them. And, and what can we do to improve the welfare of wild animals? Um, I think that there are, there are certainly other visions people have, for instance, of, of right, all free-range farming. I mean, that would only be feasible at dramatically lower meat consumption levels than people are eating currently. Um, but I, I certainly think that would reduce a lot of suffering. Uh, I'm not going to tell people to eat beef, because if anyone's been on Facebook groups in the last week, uh, they know that's not a good idea. Um, but uh, the, uh, I, I do think that there is a lot that can be done to reduce suffering within the current system, and, and then to kind of chip away at the system from the edges. So going back to kind of that incremental approach, uh, it seems like quite a feat, really, just to get people together on a single goal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so how was that accomplished? And there's probably some lessons there that could be applied to other domains as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it really helps. And, and, and to be clear, it's not all advocates. I mean, there are, there are plenty of groups that are not involved in these campaigns and are doing other great, important stuff. But it is, it is advocates at a number of the major groups, like the Humane League, Mercy for Animals, Compassion for Farming, the Humane Society. Um, I think that it helps that a lot of them have a similar worldview, a largely utilitarian worldview, and as such, they're, they're interested in, in reducing the most suffering. I think they tend to be fairly pragmatic uh, and so interested in, in finding the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and I think it really helps that they're all friends. And so there isn't, um, there isn't the kind of aspersions on people's character that I think can often happen where groups sense that they're competing or enemies with one another. A couple more um, questions coming in from the audience. Do you worry about trade-offs between global poverty alleviation, where at least some would argue that more meat consumption would be good for a lot of people, um, and animal welfare concerns, which are, you know, there, there seems to be yeah. a, a conflict there. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't think that it's, it's a major conflict. I mean, I think um, generally the places where the population is growing the fastest in the world, whether it's India or Ethiopia, they're not countries that eat a lot of meat. I mean, their, their animal product consumption is 10 times or more lower than, than Americans. So, you know, if, if, if we were forecasting having like another 2 billion Americans eating the standard American diet, I think that would create massive animal welfare problems. Um, but, but that's not the reality. And, um, and I also think that you need to, you know, take seriously human interests. I mean, I think it's, uh, um, you know, I think it's the case that most of these interventions that people are referring to are, are interventions to save people's lives um, and, and are worthy on their own terms. So maybe last question for today, and I, I believe you're going to be at office hours yep. tomorrow at 10 a.m. So first thing uh, tomorrow, if you want to get more time and, and ask a few additional questions, 10 a.m. you can do that. Um, what do you think the impact of Open Phil has been uh, relative to you know, a scenario where Open Phil had not gotten involved in this area. I mean, obviously, you're, you're right at the heart of that. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad we did. We have, I think, injected a lot more resources into the movement. Um, I think we've gotten some other large donors interested in the area. Um, and, and I hope that we have uh, created a greater emphasis on impact and, and the sort of effect work has on animals, although you, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of critiques or you know, you could believe that we've also had a negative impact by sort of dominating the space. Um, but, but I think the combination of more resources and really trying to focus on narrower goals and, and thinking hard about how can we affect the most animals per dollar. Awesome. Well, how about another round of applause for Lewis <laughs> Ballard? Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome job. All right, so that brings us to the end of our program for day one of EA Global Boston 2017. Thank you all for uh, being here and for your attention and, and great questions during all of these talks. Just a couple of quick logistics before we break for the day. Uh, one, everyone should have received an email that lists all of the, maybe not all, but at least a, a substantial number of the vegetarian and vegan friendly restaurants in the area. So definitely encourage you to go to those uh, together tonight and keep the conversations going. There are a lot of, of options, so look in your email uh, for that note. Tomorrow we begin with coffee and snacks at 9.30. The program begins at 10 o'clock. And uh, look out also for an email coming about a single group photo. We're gonna get everybody together at the end uh, of the day tomorrow and take that, that giant uh, panorama. So you wanna be a part of that. Um, and finally, uh, if you are interested in tweeting about this uh, conference, the Effective Altruism handle is at effective underscore altruism. That's at effective underscore altruism. And the official hashtag for the conference is hash EA global. So with that, thank you so much for all of your time, energy, attention, creativity on this Saturday. We look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. Coffee and snacks start at 930. Enjoy your evening.